Okay, hello, my name is Mike Pratz, and today we're going to talk about research. Now, when I give a research talk, I'm aware that many people might find it on the dry side, so we're going to try to spice it up, and I like to think of some sort of catchy name, usually involving an animal. Today, we are going to go with the chat, and a chat is a type of bird. So we're going to talk stats and chats with me, Pratz. I have some conflicts of interest, Butterfly for consulting, Med Mastery for advertisements for my podcast, and Gulf Coast as a lecturer. This talk will be organized into finding research, the types of studies, and then some basic stats. So the where is where are these articles? How do you find this research? Which is which types of studies are there? And how, how do we do the studies? How do we interpret the studies? That's when we get into the stats. Let's do it. First things first, where do you go when you need to find some literature? Google, PubMed, the first thing to know is about indexed databases. This means that the topics are organized and they have topic headings or tags that have been applied to each paper. And there's a lot of overlap between these different databases. PubMed is hosted by NIH, Embase includes in it PubMed. So there's a lot of great um, opportunities here to look in all these different databases. Remember MESH terms, M-E-S-H, that stands for medical subject headings. Those are those little bracketed things that you can search by on a lot of these platforms, and those are the tags that are applied in these indexed databases. Now we're going to transition to different types of studies. And since I'm an ultrasound guy, I can poke fun at our research here. I read a lot of them, and these studies in this graphic that was made by Dan Kim is actually really accurate. So take a look at these. We put a probe somewhere new. Let's just publish it. Check out this cool scan you can do with equipment you don't have. These are eerily accurate and a lot of funny. Follow Dan Kim. Okay, so when we talk about the different types of studies, there's a big split right off the bat. A first fork in a road is observational versus clinical trials. And when we go through all these different studies, and when I talk about a lot of this stuff, keep causality in mind, because we're trying to establish that something causes something, and we're trying to build evidence that that is true. So observational studies, we're just watching something happen, collecting data and trying to draw conclusions from what we saw. This can occur prospectively or retrospectively. Interventional or clinical trials, on the other hand, means that what we're, we're actually doing something to someone and studying what happens. And there's a few types of both of these. Oh, it's our first chat. This is a crimson chat found in Australia. What a beautiful crimson color there. You might say scarlet even. Now, within observational studies, there, let's first talk about cross-sectional and cohort. Cross-sectional is looking at a specific sample and the distribution of variables in the population. So I'm going to give you a pretty weird example. Try to stick with me here. So let's say that you want to know if having chats as pets are associated with winning the lottery. Now, just so you know, this is my disclaimer. It's actually illegal to have a chat as a pet or any wild bird, I believe. It's a federal fence, so don't mess around with that. Anyways, we are going door to door and we find out how many people have chats for pets and how many people have won the lottery. That's collecting data. That would be like a cross-sectional study. Now for the cohort studies, we're identifying a group and following them over time. So now we're enrolling people who have chats as pets, watching them over time and see who does win the lottery. Now, compared to cross-sectional, we can see how many people start to win the lottery over time. However, we're still not really able to prove causality. We just may be able to say having a chat is associated with winning the lottery. Now, for case control, it starts with the outcome of interest and then retrospectively compares those without it and with it to try to figure out if anything stands out as associated with the outcome. So for us in this example, that would be winning the lottery is the thing we're starting with now. So we identify people who have won the lottery, figure out who has chats, who does not have chats, and now we have a great idea of the association between those two things. Still no intervention here. And here we have a Jerdon's bush chat found in the hills of Southern Asia. Very handsome looking creature. Now we get into interventional. And clinical trials means that you're going to do something and see 
how it goes, see what happens. So for our outcome of winning the lottery, now we're going to intervene, we're going to give people chats as pets and see if it helps them win the lottery. Our intervention is giving them a chat, the outcome winning the lottery. So we talked a little bit about how you might use control groups, right? If they get a chat or they don't get a chat, that would be the control group when they don't have one. But we could also add blinding or randomization. These are all ways to eliminate confounders. Think about things that would cast doubt on the causality that we're trying to establish. So let's do some quick run-throughs of these as examples. So if we had no control, let's say we find one person in 20 that has won the lottery. And, you know, those are pretty good odds. So let's we're talking about like a $5 win at the lottery, not like the big mega million jackpot. So we really have no idea if the chat helped in that group because we have no other comparison. So we need a group that did not have a chat to see what is their, uh, what is the probability they're going to win the lottery and make sure that they're not winning the lottery at the same rate. Now, if this was not at all blinded, then we might accidentally favor the intervention group. So it's kind of hard to blind in our study, but maybe we could give the control group a non-chat bird, and that way we know there's not something about having a bird or the attention that they're getting that gives them an advantage in our outcome. Without randomization, there might be unaccounted for differences between the control and the intervention group. Like maybe we choose only bird people to get chats and those people are somehow better at playing the lottery. Who knows? But that's why you randomize to try to take all those other things out of play. The studies that eliminate confounders the best have the most strength in saying that this causality is in, is in fact the case. All right, so that's enough about studies. Now onto our true stats with chats. Here we have a Cape Robin chat from Eastern Southern Africa, technically a flycatcher, but since it had chat in the name, I, I left it in the lecture, so I thought you might let it fly. No pun intended there. Okay, a variable is something that changes. We're talking about different types of variables now. Dependent means it's going to change based on another variable. Independent means you don't expect it to change. In our example, winning the lottery would be the dependent variable can also be called the outcome variable, whereas having a chat was the independent, which can be called the causal variable. And the idea is that the independent causes the dependent. Other ways to describe variables are in terms of their scale. The first branch here is numeric versus categorical. Numeric means the variable is a number. You probably could have figured that one out. That can be either a continuous scale, like weight just goes, can keep adding more and more weight, or which which theoretically infinite or it can be a discrete amount and that would be discrete which is often defined as something countable like how many birds you have then we get into categorical and those are things that you can't really quantify in numbers so having a chat like our example that is dichotomous because you can either have one or you do not have one if there's more than two options then it can be either nominal which means there's no order to the categories or it can be ordinal. So nominal would be like, what type of chat do you own? And ordinal would be how high quality bird caretaker are you? Poor, moderate, or excellent? I'm sure you're all excellent. Now we have to talk a little bit about test characteristics and how to calculate them. You may remember this box. It's a little bit intimidating to me, but we use it a lot in diagnostic tests, especially like my beloved ultrasound. So don't worry, I have forgotten this many a time, but I'm gonna to try to make it as easy as possible for you. So first, we're going to talk about sensitivity and specificity. I want you to think about these in terms of the extremes. Let's look at our box here first. So if you look at the actual value columns there, that means they either really have the disease or they really don't have the disease. And then if you look at the rows starting at the left, positive test and negative test, that just tells you about your test, regardless of what their actual value is. So now we have our, our famous four two by two grid here with the true positive, false positive, false negative, true negative. Now, when you look at the sensitivity and specificity, notice that they are coming down from the columns of positive disease and negative disease. Let's start with sensitivity here. Now, when I think about sensitivity, I think I want to make sure I find everyone who has it. And that's the same thing as saying I don't want any false negatives. False negatives 
do have the disease. So you could say that you care about everyone that tests positive and also those who should have tested positive. And that's why it makes sense that it equals the true positives divided by true positive plus false negative. Because you want the false negatives to be nothing and then that would be 100% sensitivity. Specificity to me makes to me means that I want to make sure that when I diagnose somebody with something it's correct. And that means no false positives. False positives have no disease. I care about people who do not have the disease, which is the true negatives. So I take the true negatives divided by true negatives plus false positives. Look, you could just memorize it if you want, but it does make sense if you think through it. Now, a lot of you were probably taught spin and snout like specificity rules in, sensitivity rules out, but I think it's better if you think of spin like specificity is the specificity is in the negatives and snoop sensitivity is positive disease so spin no disease specificity snoop sensitivity has a disease so just another way to think about it now whereas the sensitivity and specificity are centered on the disease positive predictive value and negative predictive value are centered on the test so now we're going to look at those rows these are easier to remember because it's either going to be all positives or all negatives based on its name so if you look at the formula there the positive predictive value tp divided by tp plus fp negative predictive value tn divided by fn plus tn so you can see those ones are a little bit easier to remember because it's kind of part of the name. Now, those values, though, can mislead you. Let's talk about that a little bit. You see, predictive values are tied to the prevalence of the disease. So when the prevalence is really high, it's going to give you a higher positive predictive value. And when it's really low, it's going to give you a higher negative predictive value. And you'll see that in a lot of studies that like to boast, look how awesome we have a 99% negative predictive value. And that's maybe because there's like one in a thousand of their pathology. And so that would automatically happen. It inflates the value. So you have to be careful about that. The other thing to know about sensitivity and specificity are that those tests are, are test centered because they're only going to tell you about the test given that the patient does or does not have the disease. So try to stick with me because this is a little bit um, out there and hard to comprehend. But basically, at, think about yourself as the doctor. You're doing a test because you want to know if the patient has or does not have a certain disease. And sensitivity and specificity don't actually tell you that. They tell you if the test is going to be positive if you already know the patient has the disease. So it's a little bit backwards. And instead, that's why some people have said that what's more uh, appropriate in helping our clinical decision making is the likelihood ratios. Because likelihood ratios are disease centered. So they tell you the likelihood of having the disease given the positive or negative test, which is actually what we what we have clinically to work with. And you can see how you calculate those and notice that for both the positive and negative likelihood ratio, you're using both the sensitivity and the specificity to calculate those. Here we have a yellow-breasted chat, actually finally a North American chat that can be found in many places in America during breeding season. Very loud singers. Okay, the last test to discuss here is a number needed to treat and also with it, the number needed to harm. These are important, but um, recognize that this is going to be to show the impact of a therapeutic intervention. It gives you a feel for how an intervention leads to an outcome. And it's also really intuitive to understand, which is nice. So the number needed to treat is how many people does it take for one person to have a desired outcome? So let's talk a little bit about how to calculate it with an example. Okay, so let's say you have a study, 20 people, playing the lottery, you give half of those people chats. So in the chat group, you have one out of 10 lose the lottery. In the bird SIBO group, that's the group that you gave a, a fake bird that's not a chat, a real bird, but not a chat bird. That's bird SIBO. They lose five out of 10 times. So now we take our absolute risk reduction, 0.5 minus 0.1, that's those odds I just gave you up there, and then you take the reciprocal of that, 
that's 2.5. Your number needed to treat is 2.5, and that tells you that for every 2.5 people you give a chat, you avoid one person losing the lottery. Sounds like a great study. This is just a summary of all of those equations and the grid next to it, so you can kind of see how they all go together and how to calculate everything. Lastly, let's touch on p-values. You have to remember that for any experiment, the so-called null hypothesis is that there's no difference between groups. Well, the p-value is the probability that your results could show a difference between the groups when there was no difference in real life. So when the p-value is really low, it means that any difference observed is likely a real difference. So now you can see that we've come full circle because remember that research is all about proving causality. Once you've eliminated your confounders, calculated the correct test, you can also assess for the probability that chance could explain the differences between the groups. And a p-value of 0.05, you'll see that all the time. It's almost universally used, but it is somewhat arbitrary. And we're ending with an eastern stone chat. There's a few subspecies, but that's the best I could figure out what it is. Surprising how hard it is to get uh, copyright free images of chats, but you know, I did it for you. <clears throat> so let's summarize here observational studies, cross sectional, cohort, case control, all types of observational, no intervention in observational studies. Control, blinding, randomization, those are things that help establish causality by eliminating confounders in clinical trials. Categorical variables can be either ordinal, where there's an order, or nominal, where there's not an order. Sensitivity cares about the positive disease. Specificity cares about the negative disease. Those are just some of the highlights. Hopefully you gained something from this talk. Hopefully you learned that chats are birds. I appreciate you letting me come talk. Thanks for joining me for Chats and Stats with Pratts. Feel free to email me with any questions. Take care.